six months, he joined the staff here at the Troy Historical Society, um, about the time that Ann left. And Matt, besides having experience, you know, speaking about history, he is also a naturalist. Um, for 17 years total, he worked as education director at Dinosaur Hill. I don't know if you've heard of that in Rochester. He was an interpreter at Stony Creek Metro Park. He was also the director at the Madison Heights Friendship Woods um, area there. So he has got a lot of experience, a lot more than I do. Um, he also has some connections to France or the French language. He is married to Lori, his wife. She is degreed in French language and literature. And he has visited Paris in 2008. And he taught insects in French to third graders, which I would have loved to have seen. <laughs> All right, he also has connections to gardens and plants. Um, he's an amateur botanist, and he knows a lot about natural history, and he is curious, curious, curious. So he put in a lot of time and effort into researching this subject so that we could have a wonderful French medieval gardens presentation today. Please help me welcome Matthew Hackett. And thank you very much, Stephanie. And thank you all for being in attendance today. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, put this program together. And uh, I wondered how many people are here because this is French and they w really wanted to know about France. OK, the, <laughs> a few hands there. How many are here because gardens are the, you know, and gardens are something that you're very interested. And then how many are here because it's tea? <laughs> OK, well. That's good. I have just a couple of things to get running here, and we'll begin. Um, the medieval period is, uh, well, to say it briefly, is a long time ago. Uh, we're in a church that was built in 1837. Okay, that seems like an old church. Uh, the time period that I am speaking about is going to begin 850 years before this church was built, or rather includes that period. All right. Okay, hopefully viewable. Once the projector warms up a little bit, you'll probably get a little bit more bulb strength out of it. All right, so uh, French medieval gardens. Um, these, of course, are gardens are distinguished from farms. Uh, farms are known for their single crop and mechanized uh, operation, uh, whereas a garden might be for variety, and it's probably hand-tended. Um, garden or farms maximize land use. Uh, whereas gardens might be whimsical and just kind of take up some space in order to let people walk through, or, or they might be more designed. Um, farms aren't necessarily meant for visitors. Um, not that they don't welcome people, but if it's designed for viewing or working through it, uh, moving through it, it's probably a garden. Um, and I wanted to find out how many uh, gardeners are here. I sort of asked that question, how many were interested? Okay. How many farmers? <laughs> okay. How about a child of farmers? Okay. We can get a couple of hands for that. And for myself, I'd have to go to, you know, great-grandfather to be able to raise my hand uh, to get connected to farm. But um, in the Middle Ages, uh, nearly 90% of the population was involved in agriculture some way. And uh, gardens have a, quite a bit of variety. Uh, no two gardens are alike. And they can be from flower beds, garden plots, to whole, botan whole botanic gardens. All right, if I were to ask you, and I'm going to, <laughs> famous gardens of France. Right, good. And Monet, good. I'm trying to get the next thing to happen here. And the Tuileries, okay. I'm sorry, I'm not getting 
the next one. All right, well, believe it or not, the question that's posed there is, what do you think of? And the answers that I came up with are Versailles, the Tuileries, and Monet's garden at Giverny. <laughs> uh, I wish those would appear here because not only do I need them to appear here, but I need to get to the next slide. So let's see if I can get back out for a moment. Okay, thank you. That was John Lavender, who just saved a presentation. Um, so thank you very much, John. All right. See, I wasn't making this up. Okay, so these are typically gardens that we might think of. They're very famous. However, not one of them is medieval. So Versailles was built in the 16, um, late 1600s into the early 1700s, and we have a couple of views. One uh, sort of an uh, artist rendering, modern, and then another one, uh, a current picture taken from one of the balconies of Versailles looking out over the gardens. But medieval time is much older than this. If you were thinking of the Tuileries in Paris, um, and I thank Stephanie for, uh, she was helping feed information to me all along as this was being prepared. Uh, the Tuileries are known for their clay soil and they were making tiles. So tile and Tuilery go together. So this was um, a royal residence in the 1500s. It is now part of the Louvre. And you might see if this cursor is showing up. Something famous in the background here. Can you just make that out? It's up the hill from the Louvre. The Arc de Triomphe, right. So this is a, a much more current picture. And um, what we saw in the first slide has been uh, essentially walled in on uh, three major sides. All right, so and here's Monet's garden at Giverny. Um, made famous, of course, by his paintings, one of which is Water Lilies, that you see there. And if you were to go today, it might look a bit like that. Um, I'm hoping you can see that bridge. And again, I might use the cursor to just kind of swing past it. So there's the very same bridge that he put in his uh, famous painting. All right, the French climate uh, is a temperate climate. It's moderated by the fact that it's near the Gulf Stream, uh, which flows past um, England on its way to warming the Atlantic coast of France. In the south, it's also warmed and moderated by the Mediterranean, so it's a pretty good place to be growing things. Um, the winters are relatively mild for this latitude. I think Paris sits about the same latitude as Toronto, so, you know, it's a little ways north, and yet it's a pretty moderate climate. The medieval climate uh, was a little bit warmer. There's a period known as the medieval warming period, there it is, um, from about 1000 to 1400, which uh, fits the medieval period, which is also the Middle Ages, I should say, if I haven't said Middle Ages um, and medieval at the same time. They are one and the same, essentially. Um, so it was a little bit warmer. Architecture was changing at that time as well. Uh, there were some new ideas coming in. And the better growing conditions meant that there were sometimes even a surplus of food. And the time period before this uh, was known as the Dark Ages. And we don't have a lot to report about that. It's after the collapse of the, uh, the uh, Roman Empire. Um, and a lot of good ideas that had been uh, in play, thanks to the Romans and thanks to the Greeks, were pretty much lost until, uh, well, into the Renaissance and some even longer than that. Uh, French soils, like our own soils, have a glacial history. So 
much of them has been uh, tilled by the glaciers. Uh, there's a lot of limestone, and limestone is very important for the uh, viticulture, the growing of grapes. Um, it's the one chemistry soil, and that is a, a very good kind of soil to be growing grapes in. Um, however, during the medieval period, um, fertilizer ideas were pretty limited, and uh, we haven't had the Columbian Exchange. We haven't had a chance to get any plants from the New World uh, into France for the medieval period. So they've got the European things, which aren't so bad, and they're plowing their soils probably three times a year. All right, here's a basic timeline for the French Middle Ages. We have the dynasties in red there. So uh, Carolingian and Capetian, and the Valois, and essentially in France they had um, an unbroken series of one king leading to the next king. Um, in 887, that's marked on there, we have uh, the election, essentially, of a gentleman by the name of Hugh Capet, and so from his name we get uh, until 1328, one Capet leading to the next Capet, and so it's the Capetian dynasty. Um, I've also put in a couple of other names. Does, can anyone help me uh, give another name to Carolus Magnus? Charlemagne. Charlemagne. How about this uh, Duke of Normandy, 1066? Anybody have him? Yeah. Well, if 1066 you looked instead to England and the Battle of Hastings, you might remember William, Duke of Normandy, uh, invaded. Well, Normandy is a French province, and so this duke um, made a name for himself by his invasion, the last successful invasion of the British Isles, I'm told. All right, uh, what about um, Avignon, which is a city, uh, and I've incorporated that in a couple of time periods from 1309 to 1377 if you know your French history or if you know your Catholic history, you might realize, what is it? The, the popes were there, right. The popes lived in Avignon for that time. And so uh, a lot of the architecture that still survives in Avignon um, goes back to that period when the popes were there and it was a very important place. Um, Carolus Magnus or Charlemagne was also the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, excuse me, and um, there were many French Holy Roman Emperors during this time period as well. So France was kind of the place to be. All right, here's Charlemagne as depicted in a surviving illustrated manuscript, and he's kneeling before a plant um, that's identified as Carlina, uh, and I don't know that that's understood today, uh, the naming of things and how scientific they were about it and their descriptions um, might seem to be a little bit wanting because they talk about things and they planted things and then we can't sort out what they were planting or somebody says it's this and somebody else says it's that and they can't come to an agreement. But here he is um, kneeling before this plant and the Latin caption, uh, Again, thanks to the internet for um, translating the Latin for me, that he's, uh, he should use this plant to purge poisons. All right, well, there are some survivors from the time of Charlemagne, even though it's a long time ago. Um, some of the illustrated manuscripts are one of the things. So I've just put one on there where you can see, uh, uh, well, animals as well as text. Um, architecture from that time has very few survivors. There are a couple of churches that are still in France. Um, and they're both listed up there. I've not visited either one, and nor do I have images of them. Um, but in 805 and 814 to 847. Uh, mention again that some of the manuscripts survive, but most importantly for this talk, um, there were 90 plus plants that Charlemagne 
listed in his capitulary. Um, the, it has a much longer name than the Capitulary de Villas, um, but there was a decree that these things shall be planted in gardens where I am the boss. And he was um, in charge of a large section of what is current France, although not as far west and not as far south as the, the country that we know today. Uh, but this was a big standardization that all these gardens should have these plants in them. Um, and thanks to some surviving um, lists of those, 90 plus, we know some of the herbs and spices. And you'll see things that are familiar to us today, uh, sage, tansy, feverfew, etc. Anise, if you've got any of the pizelles back there, those little uh, discs, uh, those are anise flavored, which we kind of know as a licorice uh, kind of flavor. And then uh, the food plants, uh, carrots, not the great orange ones that we know today, but uh, probably kind of wimpy and whitish. Um, anything in the coal family, the kohlrabi, turnips, uh, broccoli, um, cabbages, that group as well. Uh, shallots, chickpeas. Um, and that last one, um, I'm going to have to be looking for that. Uh, and I, oh, no, it's a, it's a type of spinach. And my French is not good enough to pronounce it, but orage, something like that. All right. So the emperor also decreed, not just those plants, but put these in your viridarium. Oh, all right. What's a viridarium? That, that's on your sheet. Well, put these in. You need plum and peach in your viridarium. How about stone pine? And almonds, if you can get them to grow, they don't grow so well in uh, the northern part of France. So uh, you decree it and it won't grow? Uh-oh. Uh, pears, hazelnuts, chestnut, and medlar. Um, I did look for some medlars. I thought it would be really neat for you to see some medlars. And I only knew them before this thanks to Amal and the night visitors, because one of the things that they're setting out for the kings when they come in are as much of a feast as they can put together, and it includes medlars. So if you're learning about that um, operetta, or if you're singing it, you probably wonder what medlars are. So they're kind of a persimmon tasting, odd looking fruit, and it would have been nice to have them here. Um, and I found this uh, quote from the 1920s uh, about they'll be great with any kind of wine. So get your medlars, get your bottle of wine. You'll be all set. All right, so uh, bienvenue dans les jardins. And we're going to step into uh, our gardens a little bit here. Um, the nice color here is thanks to uh, a plant called Campanula, or harebell, we know it as today. So ancient steps to an ancient place. Um, I was talking about survivors, and so there'll be a little bit more of what survives to, to let us know about medieval time. Uh, the plans of the gardens. Uh, this is a Benedictine plan um, for one of the monasteries in France, and you can see that they had a lot going on. Very complex. Uh, yeah, so I think this is the abbey itself, but then it's surrounded by all these different plots and uh, easy ways to walk around them. Um, arche um, archaeobotanists and archaeologists have also looked at this. This is a village plan. I think the one that I've called up is English, um, but sort of the, the same idea that there's a place to, how much of that can you see? For spring planting, for fall planting, um, the Lord has his area that you're not allowed to use unless you have permission. There's a common pasture uh, that can be used by all who live in this particular village. All right, and back to those illustrated manuscripts. We have some garden scenes, 
So we're tending animals, uh, les animaux, and um, well, of the French insects that I taught to third graders, the one that readily comes to mind is the little jumping one, les sauterelles. So sauterelles, uh, salt like Sioux is the falls, right? Sioux Saint Marie is where the falls are. So les sauterelles is this little jumping thing. That's a grasshopper. <laughs> All right. Or you could be plowing with les boeufs. And so you can see that, yeah, j just at the bottom. We have a team of four pulling the plow in this instance. And there are surviving descriptions. Um, and this one's, oh, easy enough for you to read. It's actually hard for me to read. So I'll let you look at that for a moment. Um, So I found that they were putting these gardens together, uh, especially the monkish versions, um, as a way to help all the brothers and uh, to get them a little bit closer to the green earth. Um, and they get to watch the little fishes challenging one another. You know. um, and next to it is um, Cistercian Abbey uh, that still <coughs> stands today. Um, I think my notes would tell us. Yeah, that was built about 1098. I was going to say 1198, but it's 1098. Um, so that still stands in France. And that's the um, mother church for the Cistercian. Uh, so it was founded in this abbey. Uh, and then the description is for a, a slightly different one, but you get the idea. All right, so artwork survives. Um, and the first one that's up is a picture of a merry garden. Um, and that's often a theme of medieval uh, gardens. Uh, and so Mary is seated in this one. Um, she's the prominent figure in blue. Um, and the baby Jesus is playing just below her blue frock. Um, and he's identified by an iris, since he's part of the royal family, the House of David. Um, and, and so that kind of symbolism comes in uh, to things as well. And I think I've got a little bit more. Yes, if you don't mind me reading from what I have. Mary is seated in an enclosed garden surrounded by a castellated wall. Her crown is of leafy sprigs. Nearby, the child Jesus is being taught to play a musical in instrument. At the right is St. Michael and St. George in armor. They didn't look like they were in armor to me, but that's what it says. Um, and um, near them, a tiny ape-like devil is barely discernible. I didn't discern him at all. Um, behind Our Lady, irises, hollyhocks, marigolds, and other flowers are growing in a raised bed. Iris is the symbol of royal birth, referring to Christ descended from the house of David. And in the foreground of this one are daisies, lily of the valley, Violets, cowslips, strawberries, a rose tree and cherry apples are also visible, and several birds. And this one is held by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. So they have this particular artwork in their collection. All right, um, tapestries and wherever Stephanie is again, she found this one. Um, and it's absolutely stunning. Um, and most um, medieval gardens were in enclosed space. So in this case, uh, we're enclosing something a little more than gardens because we have the unicorn there. And well, I may not find the information on that one as readily. Uh, no, I have the one that the very last one will feature a unicorn as well, and I have the information for that. So um, these surviving things help inform us what are medieval gardens like, and they have a few things in common. They're likely to be enclosed. There are a lot of pigs moving around in medieval France, and they would love to eat what's in your garden. 
I think we call them woodchucks today. So keep them out. So they might be walled, it might be stone walls, it might be brick walls, it might be some raised turf, something to discourage those uh, porcine critters, right? Um, something called a wattle. Uh, here we are on Wattles Road. Well, um, put these wattles around to protect your garden, and we'll see more of them later. Uh, you might dig them into a hillside or create a hillside to protect it at least on one side, kind of making a little cave or a grotto of it. Um, and the raised beds are uh, sometimes in, sometimes out kind of a situation, but uh, that helps uh, get them above the pork browsing level. Oh yes, there, that was in there for a reason. Okay, that um, I should say a little bit about the planting season, and so I'll just leave that slide up for a little bit. We've got 90% of the population or so involved in agriculture, and they were a lot more in touch with the seasons than we'll ever really understand. Uh, and you know that includes my great-grandfather who was a farmer. Um, when everybody you know virtually is doing this, uh, and if they're not successful or you're not successful, um, it, it really comes back to you. So, uh, the new year for many medieval people began on March 25th, um, Lady Day, and this was a chance to see that the soils had thawed a little bit and you might get your plowing done. And the worst soils might need to be plowed by eight oxen, and you need a plowman and an, oaks, and an ox goader, excuse me, uh, in order to get that around. Um, where the soil is lighter, uh, podzol is one of those soils. I had never heard of podzol before looking into this. It's kind of a puzzle, actually. O or it's a useful uh, Scrabble word, P-O-D-Z-O-L. Um, so you might get by on those lighter so soils with fewer oxen or even horses. And the uh, sowing is for spring crops of uh, barley, oats, peas, and beans, maybe some vetch. Uh, the grains are going to be just sown by broadcast. So you walk over the fields after you've plowed and give them a, a heave. Um, peas and beans were dibbled, and you need a, di a dibbling stick to poke a hole every place you're going to put your pea or bean and then make sure, I think there's a small child probably following behind you who's trying to make sure that a pea or bean goes into every one of those that you've done. Um, and children are also necessary as these sprouts come up. Uh, they're defending them from the crows and the other marauding birds with slings. Um, however, the Lord's doves, and I, that's a small L, um, get to have whatever they want. Those belong to the Lord of the region, and if you are caught killing one of the Lord's doves, you get a big penalty. So, so what? They take your food. That's the way it goes. Um, the seed, in either case, um, might be protected by harrowing, uh, probably wooden harrows, um, there was probably nobody that had an iron tooth harrow or uh, only the richest people could afford to have a smith make them harrows like that. So think of a big rake that you have to draw across, across that. And if the harrow couldn't break up the soil, then follow with a mallet and break up some of the clods yourself. Everybody's enjoying the Middle Ages now, right? <laughs> um, you're also putting in not just things to eat, but maybe you can get some cash crops. Maybe you could grow some medicinal herbs. Maybe you could grow some dye crops, like madder, which makes a red dye, woad, which is blue, or dyer's greenwood, which, of course, gives us a nice green color. And if you're putting in herbs, uh, we had um, Charlemagne's advice for what to put in. Um, and if I haven't mentioned parsley, summer savory, mustard, onion pop, uh, opium poppy, coriander, those are in there as well. Um, and the cows 
are coming into full milk as May turns to June, and we're hoping to get milk and butter from them. All right, so the variety, and I've sort of touched on it. Um, medieval gardens, they needed to do everything for everybody. So you got to have your herbs. Flavor your food, something you can trade with somebody else. Um, your pot herbs, or pottages, is one of the things, and spices. And I think I'll interrupt um, for a moment, and I might pull this with me, if I can get it out without too much noise. Okay. Yeah, a short tether, but that's okay. Um, I brought in to show you a few things. Uh, some pot herbs that you probably already know. Uh, cabbage, which is le chou. Le chou, right? Um, leeks, these uh, onions on steroids um, <laughs> that actually, you know, cook up to be pretty tasty um, and are obviously available even today. And fennel, uh, that uh, licorice type flavor, you can stir fry that in or if you've got your uh, pot de feu, which I'll explain a little bit, uh, you might be adding that. And then I'll get back to uh, a couple of things here in just a moment. All right. So talking about the variety that we had here, we're putting fibers in. You're planting flax. You're planting hemp. Uh, you're going to get fibers from your animals. You've got sheep. You'll get wool from them. Of course, your standard vegetables. So the pot herbs um, generally are leafy um, to be divided that way, but I'm sure there were some people that would call some of the vegetables that I would think are in that group, they would call them uh, pot herbs as well. The dye plants that I mentioned, um, I think there was a yellow as well. Weld is a yellow. So I said woad, which was blue. blue. And matter, which is? Red. How about that? <laughs> this is like you're paying attention. <laughs> or that you already knew. Is it? Okay. Um, and then your medicinals, and the name of that garden might be called a physic garden. And, um, and then I have some pictures um, uh, taken currently um, that will show you some of the medieval gardens that are out there. This one at, at uh, Bois Richaud. And uh, my note says, look at the wattles that raise the beds and stones to guide you through a very simple plan. Uh, this is the Colomiere medieval garden. And here the, the wattles are more as cages, you know, help, helping to keep the plants from falling onto the pathways. Um, and I'm hoping you can see how lovely the hollyhocks are there. And I wasn't sure whether we had a campanula or a, a borage plant um, on the right hand side, that bluish one. Uh, and I guess it could be something else altogether. Um, you know, you can be a naturalist, but if it's just a slide that you're looking at, um, it's hard to know. Okay, so wattle uh, is also known in construction, uh, wattle and daub. So you put the wattles together, these stakes that uh, are the main support and interwoven are uh, lesser twigs, uh, likely willow, something that's, you know, bendable uh, as you put it together, and then daub some clay on it. And so there's for the fence, and then also shown in the corner of that building. So that's uh, in a village in France to let people see uh, that kind of construction. So um, I know there are a couple of buildings here where we've left 
uh, an open spot, so you can sort of peer into the wall. This is the same idea. See how it's put together. Okay, so spices in the garden. Uh, anise I've alluded to, thanks to the pizelles that are here, um, and fenugreek. And apples of many varieties. There were scores of apple varieties, even in the Middle Ages. And uh, some of those have been lost and others have been developed. Uh, the Renaissance really saw an expansion of the variety of uh, all kinds of things, the New World being involved, but uh, gardeners paying more attention. Um, so heritage ap apples um, are what we call them today. And then um, I've got quince, which um, various sources, is this a Greek import, or did it come from Crete, Crete? or you know, maybe they don't know. But quince uh, was definitely part of the medieval fair. And I brought in a couple of quince. And had it in mind that I would cut one open, and I should have done it beforehand, because I left the knife here. Yes, yes, I should have done this beforehand. <laughs> no, perhaps not. Or it has a harder center than I. Of. Well, um, these are good for marmalades, and they're somewhat tart. I'm going to lose that. And I don't mind uh, quince going around if you just want to see what one is like. And these were available at uh, Papa Joe's. Had to track them down. That sounded good. Yes. Oh uh, no, it's a separate. Uh, fruit itself, um, and I could tell you its blossom has five parts, looking at you know, this uh, transection of them. Um, but that'll bring out the smell a little bit. And we'll start one over there as well. So um, I, I guess when it's a new fruit, like medlars, it's hard to describe you know what it is because it's not like an apple, it's not like a pear, um, and no, it's not a cross between. Okay, um, also during this time, it appears that uh, some new fruits found their way in. Uh, the apricot uh, appears to have an origin in Armenia, or at least that district, and some pistachio plants, but certainly the pistachio nuts we're finding their way from Syria or Persia, uh, today's Iran. And we're back to the pot herbs again briefly, although I've put in another one there that you didn't see before. Um, most of us know it as a weed. In the uh, upper left, anybody recognize that weed? It's here in the village. And i look for a second without my glasses. Because if Pat were here, who's been tending the uh, Pioneer Garden, she would say something unpleasant about purslane. But you can eat it. So it's in the family Portulaca, if you've heard of that. Or you, know, you, you might buy those. Um, so if they have a nice big blossom, you, you appreciate them for that. If they have this tiny blossom and this uh, the fleshy leaves, you can cook them into things and you eat the stems as well. Okay, there's le chou. And uh, if you want to say something endearing to someone, that a child or your significant other, you might say, you are my petite chouchou. You are my little tiny cabbage. Um, but it, it also, since uh, petite goes with shoe, uh, Brussels sprouts, you know, little tiny cabbages. So they might be uh, sprouts, Brussels, but petite shoe would also be in there. Uh, leeks are there, this time with their Latin. Um, so in the decree, 
everything was Latinized. So uh, Charlemagne in his capitulary didn't give the French name for all these, he gave the Latin name as understood at the time. Um, and Poros is, goes with that. And uh, this survives today as well, the idea of a pot de feu, a pot on the fire. And into it goes whatever you didn't eat today, whatever you managed to scrounge in the vicinity, um, because it's an ongoing simmering pot, you can make soup of it, um, and you probably know a nursery rhyme about peas in that pot. Peas porridge hot, peas porridge cold. Right, so after the ninth day, you've added a lot of other things, but there's probably some surviving peas from that first um, installment. Uh, right, there's a children's story uh, called Stone Soup, um, trying to get everything together. Um, right, that something needs to flavor those stones that you put in. All right, um, and I'm kind of winding up uh, because if you go today, you can see some of these things. Uh, the manuscripts, you're going to have to go, you know, someplace like an art museum. Um, I had hoped to tie this into the DIA, uh, but the, uh, that good idea didn't actually get uh, put into action um, because I'm sure they have uh, some great artwork that might show you a medieval garden or at least something of the medieval trades that are out there. Um, there are garden festivals. You notice the date on this one. So get your plane ticket because <laughs> it goes, you see, from April to 21st October. So, um, and this is not necessarily medieval gardens, but um, that was one of the featured gardens among many in this particular garden festival. Um, the town of, thank you, Uzes, um, is known for having uh, saved um, a monastery. And you can't see much of that, I'm sorry. OK. Well, you can see that it's rather extensive. And then um, within the, the grounds around this abbey are these gardens that they have made every effort to make um, look as they would have some 800 years ago. Uh, in Lorraine, two, L, two R's, not our Lorraine, but uh, another Lorraine, they also have some medieval gardens. <coughs> and what is enclosing those beds? Waddles, right. When you drive out of here, what street? No. <laughs> All right, and then um, the last one does um, feature a unicorn again, and that one did have a little information. Oh, but I've got to find it. Um, this is from a kit. You can bring the uh, Middle Ages into your home if you are great at cross-stitch. This was a kit that was offered. How come I'm not seeing it? All right, well, I'm not seeing it, but uh, it describes uh, the various flowers that are in here, and I guess you're going to be working at it quite a long time to uh, create something as nice as that, but uh, an outfit in the UK provides this, and uh, you can connect to it that way. All right, well, um, if you had one of these, you've probably heard some of the words mentioned. Um, I haven't really filled out that timeline, um, but it's peopled by um, some folks that you might know. Uh, Charlemagne, of course. Um, I have these images of Richard I, also called Coeur de Leon. And uh, I'll just start those around. These are um, 
an image that was made in France and it's now available for rubbings. I think there's a full size one, but this is downsized a little bit. And uh, he was born in uh, 1157. Um, and this effigy was made at a French abbey. And he was king of England while living in France almost the whole time because he was another Duke of Normandy. And if they wanted to rule England offshore, well, they got to. Um, so anyway, if you want to see sort of what one might look like, <coughs> if, if you were a man of means, and Joan of Arc, she fits into this time frame. and led the French to a successful uh, campaign in Orleans. And then, uh, mainly because she kept wearing men's clothing uh, and uh, continued to say that she had talked to God and that until God told her that she should change her clothing, that she would just keep it on, um, she lost her life. Uh, even though she was essentially the friend of the king and the victors, they didn't step in to try to help her. Um, oh, and I wanted to say, um, I found an interesting book. A Medieval Home Companion, and this is translated from, uh, from French in 1393. And uh, I'll just finish up with the contents here, um, a smattering of them. Uh, cherish your husband's uh, person carefully. That's one of the um, little chapters. Take care that there are no fleas in your room or in your bed. <laughs> uh, many perils come from talking too much. If you want to graft a cherry tree, so you can get some information for your garden. Um, how to take care of your furs and dresses, and uh, a dish for unexpected guests. So a little bit of Martha Stewart in there as well. Um, I think I'll take questions that you have and show you a couple other things as, as your questions come, I guess. So. I can tell you what some of those are, yes. Okay. So, um, this began because Parmentier is a, if I follow my, one of my family lines far enough back, I'm a Parmenter, just as much as I'm a Hackett. Um, a Parmentier is a sewer of facings and trims, so that's H, kind of starting in the middle there. Uh, Arpenteur is a land surveyor. If Boniface is your surname, perhaps at some time you or your family were innkeepers. How about Charpentier? Everybody got that one, right? Carpenter. So you didn't have any trouble with number three nor eight. Um, Parmentier, I already did. Ilier is the tile or slate roofer. Number five would be G. And six, lavender. Uh, lava is washing. Right? And Lorimer, that's probably in there because my wife's name is Lori. And then her maiden name was Naramore, but that doesn't quite fit. Anyway, that's the uh, bridal maker. All right. All right. Yeah, it, it was very interesting as I came in. Uh, the ladies up front with their smartphones were looking these things up. And I thought, oh, they're going to have all the answers before I even get to it. But. All right, well, thank you so much for being such an attentive audience. And I appreciate your being here and your good attention. <laughs>